the real objective is to provide insight on the how-to of ma uh, managing projects and navigating the challenges that come with it. Each project is very unique, uh, but the challenges, how you handle the challenge may be different depending on the geography you are in or the organizational behavior of the um, environment where you are. Okay, so first of all, let me just ask, I, I, I know that we know this, but there's a reason why I'm asking this question. What, what do you think a project is? Okay, someone says it's temporary and has a begin and end. Uh, yeah, that is absolutely correct. Um, uh, let me ask you another question. It's a project only when it has to do with an organization. Someone says no, and that is absolutely true. Uh, kitchen renovation is a project. A wedding is a project. It has an end, a beginning and an end. It has a budget. You have stakeholders, right? Or even obtaining a degree or trying to get your uh, PMP certification is a project, isn't it? Because you have a time frame for it, right? So that's why I said that we have actually all been doing projects. Um, I mean, probably much of our life, and we've been using different, um, uh, what you call uh, reference frameworks, right? It, except that we didn't document it. Uh, we all have it up in our head. So the reason why I'm using this approach is to break the demystify project management so that you can relate with some of the things we're gonna talk about here today. So we do know that our, top, our time, costs, and quality uh, the triple constraints that we have on projects. And we do know that um, if we do not manage this triple constraint properly, then we would probably not be able to uh, you know, achieve our project objective. So who are the key players and their roles? What, what do you think? Can I have some, you know, if, if you have a project, let's take a wedding, for example, who are the key players? And what do you think are the roles of these people? In a, let's take wedding for an example. Okay, wedding planner, okay. Um, the couple, yes. What about your in-laws? <laughs> the guests, I like what I'm seeing. The vendors, good. Somebody's drilling down further and that is really good because this is really important in planning a wedding. Who do you think is the project manager? The event planner. Absolutely, because the person, he's the person coordinating and getting everybody to do their own part, right? When the pictures will happen, uh, with the venue, uh, when what will happen, at what point, right? The roles of the key players, all right? Uh, so in a typical project, you will have a sponsor, you have a project manager, you have your stakeholders, and then your project team members. These are usually the core players now, for the stakeholders, you could have uh, several entities that represent your stakeholders. Sometimes they are suppliers, your customer, even the regulators. So these are your keys, as, uh, you know, the key players and what their roles are. Um, and the practice itself in project management, um, you know, across different geographies, you have different roles. They are project, project management. It's just that some of them are entry level, uh, mid level, and senior level. Uh, if you take a look at this map that I'm sharing here, for example, when I came here to the US, one of the things I've never heard that before was the project uh, specialist. It's a little bit like someone who has um, multi year experience with project management. So you're basically providing overseeing other project managers. This is not program management, it's different. So, uh, and then you have um, people, uh, roles or other project coordinator or project associate. I mean, we all know project manager, right? But um, for example, in Canada, I, I don't know, but at least I understand that you have project manager, but there could be other roles, you know, that you will, you know, that you will find in this profession. So those are some of the things you need to have at the back of your mind um, when you're entering into a new geography. Uh, for example, when I came here, one of the things I learned was uh, when you first come, that try to get in uh, either entry level or mid level and then climb. Because usually you come with experience from another country and they are looking for someone who has experience here. So the easiest way for you is to get it into the entry level, maybe a project called 
the NATO. Even it doesn't matter your years, uh, you probably want to tune down your years of experience and then you get into the job and then you can then climb the ladder. Uh, now with the so many frameworks that we have uh, on project management, Agile, Waterfall, uh, within Agile, you still have Scrum. There are all kinds of roles that are coming up, like a Scrum Master. A Scrum Master manages a project differently from a project manager, but I'm not getting into it, which we will deal with all this when we get into uh, the core class itself. But it's important that you have know all these uh, titles and understand how they differ. Uh, while the project manager basically mount, like control, using authority to control everybody in terms of you got to do this, the Scrum Master basically guide, guides the team uh, to follow the uh, Scrum principles and allow people to do their job, right? So there are two different things. So you need to have this at the back of your mind when you're looking for roles. You need to know what those roles mean. We'll talk about them later. In project management, we have five phases at least from the general uh, framework, uh, the PMI framework. So these five phases, we talk about conception and initiation, uh, which is where we produce our project charter. Uh, we start uh, do our stakeholder analysis. Then you have the definition and planning. This is where we do our scoping and budgeting, work uh, breakdown schedule, the Gantt chart, and even our communication plan, even though you might have started it off as, as you are doing your stakeholder analysis. And then, of course, you have the project execution itself, and then you monitor uh, its performance, and then finally you uh, close out the project. If you look at this slide here, you can see there are very, some activities there, and with some some of them are also uh, deliverables or standards for deliverables. All right. So um, uh, one thing I want you to go away with here. Now you may not necessarily read this in the book, but I'm just telling you from experience. Every project is unique. That you may have known already. The challenges may be similar. Now listen to this. But the resolution is heavily influenced by cultural and organizational behavior. Let me explain. If you're on a project, in the Middle East, let me use the Middle East, for example. If you're on a project in the Middle East, Middle East, the culture in the Middle East is that you don't talk to your um, senior, you know, you don't correct your senior directly, right? You probably wanna tell somebody else to tell your senior, or you find a way to say without, you know, appearing uh, like you're trying to correct them because they could walk off the project. Uh, feeling insulted. That's culture. The other thing is within the organization, when you come into an organization, you need to understand what the political and cultural atmosphere. Every company has values. And that value usually translates into the way be people behave. Let me give you an example. If you go to Ghana, I, I've done projects in Ghana, which when you get to Ghana, uh, the Ghanaians, they're very nice people. They are not lazy. Don't be mistaken about that. We, we have, usually have that idea, but they're not. But the point is that they like taking things a little bit easy. Within organizations, it's the same attitude, right? And so you need to have this political and cultural awareness for you to resolve whatever challenge that you have in, 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 you know, on a project. And why I'm saying this is because this is usually things that revolve around people and stakeholder management. More, more on that later. So why do projects fail? Usually projects fail because uh, we have unclear goals. But sometimes it's not because we have unclear, we may have clear goals, but the project still fails or we have unrealistic expectation or lack of risk resources, uh, you know, lack of resource for the planning that we need to do, poor communication or inadequate risk management. Now, all of these five things I mentioned now, the singular denominator in all of this that connects all of them is, is people. It's about managing stakeholders. So if I'm not communicating well, it's obviously I'm not engaging. I, it's possible I would not have clear goals. It's also possible I'm, I'm not going to get the resources that I need. It's also possible that I will miss out on the 
expectation or misinterpret what those expectations are. And because I missed all of this, I will not be able to see where the risks are. And then eventually what happens? The project will fail. But if you look at all of the, all of the five of them, it's all about people, isn't it? Okay, so the project, even a project, you know, a project that you cross to your, it dotted your eye, you cross your T, could still be a failure if it does not meet the return on investment. There are certain projects that are measured based on return on investment, right? It's not about you finished it early. It's about the value that the project delivered. Not that we, the, uh, our documentation was top notch. Our presentation was top notch. Uh, we did everything according to the book. It can still fail. If at the end of the project, the objective isn't met, uh, maybe they, they, they are looking at um, that after we have delivered this project, in the first three months, we want revenue to have jumped by 25%. If by that second month, the revenue has not jumped to that 25%, the project is a failure, even though you did everything right. So this, the reason why I'm you know, highlighting this is that when you get on a project, don't become too overly focused on the technicalities of your documentation, or you know, this has to be done at this time, this or that. Don't be overly, focus more on the people side of it to understand what is really going on, why they are doing what they are doing. Why are they doing this project? Sometimes what they write on the paper may not be what you're seeing. We'll talk more on that later. So as a project manager, you need both soft and hard skills. And I will explain that. For your soft skills, you need to be able to know how to make your presentations. So if you haven't, like, you don't know how to talk to people, you should start practicing now. Uh, you can get on YouTube, uh, get uh, some training, sign up for, uh, you know, get into some kind of networking event that gives you the opportunity to, to be able to speak or share some insight, you know? Uh, that will help you to, you know, hone on uh, up your um, presentation skills. Same thing with communication. While communication and presentation skills may look similar, they are not the same. How you say something, the way you say it, it's about communication. I gave us an example of the Middle East. In Nigeria, for example, the way we talk is also different. When you come to the US here, the way we talk to our seniors or subordinates is different. In fact, let me tell you something. I'm a Nigerian. If I use the style of managing my subordinates, of my project team members, the way I manage them in Nigeria. If I do it here, probably half of my team will be gone by the next morning. I won't have anybody to do my work. And this environment is like a place where somebody can just call you without any pre-notice, call you in the morning that they're not coming today, they're calling sick. You know, so you need to understand all this cultural difference. You know, I talked about it earlier on. So, but communication skills is that you need to be able to find a way to engage your team members, your stakeholders, all of them, to be able to get the information you need that will help you to see the risk before they uh, you know, actualize. And you'll be able to put in some mitigation plans to be able to manage it. Because if you can communicate well and manage your risk, then it's easy to handle conflict resolution, which is the third one at the bottom. Conflict resolution. You must be able to um, you know, if you can communicate effectively and have a relationship of trust and integrity, it's easy to resolve conflict. And then decision-making skills, very, it's also very important for you as a, a PM. And leadership skill, because you have people that are looking up to you to provide direction on the project. And then uh, on the hard skills, this is where now we say, oh, you need to learn this tool. Um, some of us, believe it or not, as a PM, it's important that you have business analysis skills because you're going to be doing some data analytics. You're going to be doing performance monitoring. You must be able to know what those figures mean or what those KPIs mean and how they impact, impact not just the project, but the overall success of the client that you're working with. Because if you do not have this insight, 
and you just, you know, you're just completing tax and taking them up. You might just be surprised that even though you've crossed, uh, you know, dotted your I's, crossed your T's, your project is still not a success. All right. So you need planning skills. If you don't know how to do that, you need to, it's not just, now listen to me, project management alone will not teach you that skill. You need to get some of the training in terms of how estimating is done. Top, bottom, bottom up estimation. How is that done? What does it even mean? Budgeting skill, a little bit of some financial skill. You don't need to be, uh, what do you call it? What's the certification? Um, is it ACCA certified? No, but you need some level of financial uh, analytics skill that will help you to be able to do, but because you must be able to interpret a spreadsheet that has all these numbers and money and how they, uh, you know, how they are allocated. And then uh, I'm going to leave domain expertise. I'll come back to it now, but I want to talk about managing risk. You must be able to understand how what risk is or how it's managed and how it's mitigated. And then of course we talked, I already talked about the project analytics and all this, um, like uh, I think one of the participants said, she wants to be able to know how to calculate uh, project performance, okay? But from my experience again, I'm telling you that domain expertise is really important so some of you are coming from different industries. Some of you, uh, someone said she wants to practice uh, architecture. Uh, and I know some of you want to be in the uh, be project manager in the health sector. Uh, some want to be project managers uh, in, in the government, public sector. All these industries have peculiarities in terms of how projects are handled. They're not the same. So you have to decide within yours. And, and then some people want to stay in the technology space. Now, all the certifications you see out there may not be right for you, even though they're all project management related. So besides having a PMP, you need to get domain expertise. So you need, a, 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 for example, in the UK, for example, Prince2 is usually the one because a lot of the projects are government related projects or public sector related projects. And that's why they use Prince too. Because if you get to UK now, even though you have PMP, they'll probably go for the guy who has the Prince too before the PMP. Except for, of course your PMP shows that you've worked across that count of industry before and you have the experience to deliver. So the domain expertise is really important for you. 